This is A Confused Heap of Facts, the podcast where we have a discussion about history with the faculty of the Department of Military History and the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, or U.S. Government. Hello, this is Dr. Jonathan Abel, and we are here today with Professor Dr. Sean Kalick. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And we're here today to talk about a, a, a topic that does get discussed a lot, but I think in ways that are not always helpful, particularly to, to listeners who are not already steeped in it, uh, which is the way that, that, in particular, theorists approach the Cold War for about its first 15 or 20 years or so. Um, and, and often what we have in this topic is, on the one hand, we have historians who are looking at what happened. We have a lot of theorists, including contemporary theorists, who are, who are shaping strategy and policy and then later looking back and, and drawing theory and models out of it. And they often don't talk to each other. Or if they do talk to each other, they talk to each other in ways that aren't particularly helpful. Um, and so, Dr. Kalick, what, what I think the value you bring to this is that you have a foot in both, and that you've done both the, the kind of um, poli-sci, strategic studies side, and the history side. So let's start at the beginning. If we're talking about the Cold War, if we're talking about theory, what do we actually mean by that? What is the theory being designed to do? I think there's two ways to approach this. I guess we'll start with the political science, strategic studies side, and then go into the history side, because... Having spent time in, you know, IR theory and then strategic studies, which was all about you know nuclear strategy and arms control, what I found interesting about that is it's all theoretical and it's about I remember reading Peter Pry's book, and it's all about you know probability is a kill. How how can you ensure you're going to take out the enemy using you know ICBM fields and submarine bases and all this other you know counterforce targeting ideas. And when I went to history, that, that was great when I was doing it, right? Awesome. You know, you build war plans, you, you need X number of warheads to do A, B, C, and D, and you have to factor in overkill and all this other fun stuff. But when I went to history, they kept emphasizing this thing called people, uh, which the, I reflected back on. I was like, wait a minute, we never talked people. <laughs> we never talked humans and emotions and this Cloud Switzy and human dimension thing. It was all it was always very mathematical and formulaic that okay you need 10,000 warheads here's your target set and then you apportion your warheads per target and then you make assumptions about um, radiation and mushroom clouds and all that fun stuff there was never a discussion about humans be making decisions about number one launching weapons and then how they respond and interact afterwards so I think from the two perspectives the political science folks tend to deal with it in, in, in a purely theoretical almost doctrinal kind of way uh, the historians tend to look at it as, okay, that's good, but there's also people making these decisions and doing these actions. So uh, understanding that you need to kind of have a foot in both worlds, you need to understand the kind of practical side, the non-emotional side of it, but then I guess I'm a true Klausowitzian, right, that you can't extract the human emotion from this thing, right? which is, I think, one of the problems when we study nuclear theory, and specifically the terms of strategy, that it becomes very um, mathematical and like a calculus, but yet the reality is, how are people going to respond and, and act under pressure? We just don't know. So we're, we're in kind of the tail end of World War II. Um, there's already tension between the capitalist and the Marxist worlds. Um, how then do we move to outright um, Cold War slash potential for nuclear war? Um, I think it's just a setup of the end of the Second World War, right? So FDR makes some deals with Stalin that that allows the Soviet army or the Russian army to stay in large swaths of Central and Eastern Europe with, with the promise that there's going to be open and free elections, which there are elections. I'm not sure they're so open and free. <laughs> they're heavy and manipulated to ensure that the, the Communist Party comes out on top. Um, and the reality is a Soviet force in Central and Eastern Europe uh, is anywhere from two to one to three to one over the kind of allied forces, specifically the U.S. force. So in the early planning stages, we know we can't necessarily 
match the Red Army one for one in a conventional fight. So we have this atomic bomb that we can use as, to borrow a current phrase, a strategic offset. So the idea that if you have to fight against the Soviets, you can use nuclear weapons as a way to kind of counter their significant conventional footprint. Um, the first planning is really, you take the strategic bombing operations and campaigns of World War II, and now you interject atomic weapons into it. Uh, the problem is they don't have the aircraft to carry them, and they don't have the bombs to, to prosecute the war. So you start ramping up the production facilities for both. And this is where NSC 68 kind of comes into play, and the idea that, okay, if you're going to start p building war plans, what do you need as far as a grand strategy? And by, well, are you 46, 47? We're always starting to think about the future, and nuclear weapons have become a part of this, despite the fact that there was a, a brief moment where the Truman administration under the Baruch plan tried to propose, let's give these things to the UN, ban them outright, and, uh, which was a, a, a useful idea at the time. A good idea at the time, but the Soviets couldn't understand if you have this potential, why would you ever want to give it up? Right. Because um, they were working towards their bomb, they didn't have it yet, um, so they vetoed the plan. So we're kind of stuck in this kind of arms racing all of a sudden, and then the Soviets are going to detonate their first bomb in '49, uh, and then by that time I think we're off and running. But I think it hinges on that as Truman demobilizes the Second World War, you recognize that the Soviet Union is becoming a threat, specifically in Europe. Asia later, um, and the reality is if you don't fight, if you don't want to fight conventionally, you're going to have to use atomic weapons. So you start building up that architecture as a means to kind of at least balance the Soviet footprint. Yay. So thank you, Dr. Kaler, for being here. So this is Dr. Angelo Riado I'm also joining Dr. Abel today. Um, so speaking about the atomic weapons, um, it's a weapon, right? So when it was first developed, how did people, both maybe in the Soviet Union or the United States, see it? What, did they consider it as a just a new innovative weapon, or did they realize it was going to initiate a military revolution, a nuclear revolution? Um, I'm not sure if I buy that nuclear revolution thing, which was just, you know, the whole McGregor Knox and Williamson Murray argument. I, I think it does change the way nations practice and think about warfare. Um, I think it tries to suppress warfare down to a much lower level, so we'll, we can talk about ladder of escalation later. Um, let me handle the American side first and the, and the kind of British side, and then we can go to the Soviet side, because the Soviets, I, th I believe, think about nuclear weapons completely differently than we do. Um, there was always a, a discussion on the U.S. side about the ethical and moral entity of the atomic weapons, specifically after the first test and then specifically Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Probably the most famous one is Oppenheimer, who kind of questions why we even did this. Uh, and there's discussions that maybe we should put the genie back in the bottle, and the reality is you can't. Um, and I think that, that element maintains itself in the United States, that there's this moral quandary that we've developed this devastating, horrible weapon, but yet, if you don't want to fight a conventional war and ramp up again, maybe you have to use it. So that, I think, becomes kind of the prevailing military side. That it, it's needed to maintain balance in the global um, security environment. The Soviets on their side have always seen it, from my perspective and my study, as uh, another weapon. It's just a bigger artillery piece. You know, people people die and bad things happen in war. Atomic weapons just you know make it you know ten times better and harder. That's and all. faster. And faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you've you've walked us through a good chunk of the history kind of of the early period it, to, to borrow a phrase who are the people who are in the first generation of nuclear theorists the people who are trying to figure this out as it's being built uh, th those folks uh, I mean some folks look at Oppenheimer right and the idea that uh, as kind of the father of the bomb the theoretical father of the bomb and Edward Teller is probably one of those two but they take two different paths uh, Oppenheimer is the one who says you know this is probably a horrible thing you know, the destroyer of worlds, right? Right. Uh, and Edward Teller is a much more kind of in the, in, I don't want to say in the Soviet vein, but it's a weapon. Um, the job of a military and a military industrial complex is to ensure that the nation has capability and capacity to, to win wars. And if you can leverage physics and quantum physics to do this, why not? Mm -hmm. um, so Very those, effective. It, it's, it is, it, it's effective at killing people. And if the objective is towards to kill your enemy, Atomic weapons work very well, and so, as do nuclear weapons, as do hydrogen weapons. Um, so I think those two guys 
are more on the theoretical side and in the engineering and physics, but become kind of the beginning of what becomes a discussion about it. Um, the real f- kind of godfathers of, of theory, I think, are um, Henry Morgenthau, uh, Bernard Brody, who start talking about, you know, has this new weapon changed the very nature of war, the character of war, which is that uh, military revolution that uh, Dr. Riotto talked about. Uh, and there's a b- debate. Um, I think Brody's on the side of, you know, strategy in the missile age, this new weapon has fundamentally changed the way we think about warfare now, which I, I think is true, that you don't want to necessarily always go uh, jump right to war, especially if you have this capacity. And I think that that's more, that's reinforced uh, specifically after the Soviets get the bomb in 49. Uh, Morgenthau, who happens to be kind of the father of the realist school, is, well, war's war, so therefore you have to be prepared to fight and, and use it. And those arguments trickle down to the military, and the, and the military is is wrestling with, uh, okay, if you, the way they, they have traditionally fought is you mass armies on an objective. Uh, but the problem is in the nuclear age, if you mass an army, it becomes an awesome target for an atomic weapon. Mm-hmm. So how do you start dispersing armies, but yet get the mass effects? And the reality is, well, you just start massing the effects through fires, which means atomic weapons. So I think the military is relatively quick to embrace it because, again, their job is to fight and win, and they can use it. They don't necessarily fully understand the ramifications of using it yet because they haven't done all the research that they're going to do from, you know, the mid-40s up through the 70s, really. Um, But yet a weapon's a weapon, uh, and they have different effects. So you start playing with those ideas. So really the first generation of theorists, I think, come from science, engineering backgrounds, and then you have Brody and Morgan Thou, who are much more academic, and then you get kind of variations of those schools as you move through uh, the 50s and 60s, and there's policy makers that are going to get injected into this, like some folks will credit Kissinger and McNamara as kind of the next generation of theorists. You have Herman Kahn, another academic, who's going to kind of propose and build this escalatory ladder. Uh, you have Herman Wolk and a whole bunch of others who will we'll sally forth into the debate on how do you use them and what is their proper role? And really the debate focuses on are they political bargaining chips, i.e. deterrence, or are they useful weapons that you have to essentially lord over your enemy and say, okay, if you want to take it to this level, we will go there and win. And I think that's the essence and the simplicity of the debate. So you, you've highlighted something very important that's happening here, which is you mentioned that we have military theorists, and, and often they're practitioners, right? The air power theorists coming out of World War II, the people in you know Army, Air Force, Navy, and then we have this branch of civilian government employees, whether it's somebody like Paul Nitz on the National Security Council, or um, Kennan, who's a <coughs> State Department employee, or, or um, the physicists of the Manhattan Project, like, like um, Oppenheimer. But now we have a third group, which is this essentially civilian academics. And as you mentioned, some of them move in and out of government. So we, we understand the first two, right? The government employees, it's kind of their job to do this stuff. How does academia and kind of the intelligentsia, how do they kind of enter the debate and, and establish themselves there? No, they're kind of looked to by the military and the government as, okay, you're the ones with the pointy heads, right, who think about big ideas. And some of them had government work during the Second World War, and one of the, one of the foundations of the Cold War is maintaining that relationship between universities, think tanks, or what becomes think tanks, and the government as a way to leverage intellectual power. Um, and, and they kind of enter that way, that you don't always trust the military, because as you said, they're practitioners, they're not you know, theorists, they're not thinkers, they're not strategists. Well, some of them might be. Uh, but the reality is maybe you can temper that with true academic thought and ideas. And I think that's how they enter the debate. And they main, maintain themselves, uh, I think, throughout the whole longevity of the Cold War. And they kind of end up in those same two schools, right? Are you in the nuclear weapons are usable, but yet a weapon of last resort? And that evolves into the 70s and 80s that, you know, we're starting to talk about, like, Colin Graves. No, you can fight and win a tactical nuclear exchange, which Herman Kahn kind of ends up there, too, which is kind of bizarre. Versus the others who kind of embrace what becomes mutual show destruction that, well, nobody wins with these things. They they become good bargaining chips that you can kind of lord over one another. But the reality is if you have to use them, you've probably already lost. And, And I think Brody starts to kind of build that school relatively early on. Uh, but yet n- can't come to grasp with 
if you admit it that you, you're not going to use them, you kind of lose credibility. So therefore, you, your deterrent value kind of sinks a bit. So you kind of have to always at least act like you're prepared to use them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the academics do a lot of a lot of good work trying to explain what becomes classic deterrence theory, kind of nuclear deterrence theory, and the proper role of nuclear weapons. And it's just a debate for the duration of the Cold War because luckily it was all theory. Yeah, right, right, right. So where are Brody and Morgenthau coming from? You mentioned their academics, but what is, what's relevant in their background to this debate? Um, they're political scientists in, in many ways, right? They, and they want to understand um, the new environment. So coming out of the Second World War, right? I think they both served with the Navy, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that. Um, and Morgenthau, as a realist, is trying to understand, he does a lot of work on deterrence, uh, like classical deterrence, like with with uh, navies and arms racing, and how have nuclear weapons either just taken the place of battleships, or have they fundamentally changed the nature of the way we think about warfare? And I think Brody's on that same kind of track. So it really is, as Dr. Rieto talked about, is this an inflection point in the way you think about the continuum of warfare? Uh, whereas warfare in the past has been a relatively easier thing to conduct. Uh, it is, yes, it's painful and bloody and violent, but now all of a sudden it's, it's much easier and the scale is, scale and scope is much more significant. Um, and I think that, that fuels them to think about what is the proper role and what is the proper place of these new weapons. Yeah, so thinking about um, the academic historians, the human dimension, of course, historians, we have different focuses and we have different ways of analyzing the documents. So whether you analyze more of the political side, the economic side, how about the rise of like social history and cultural history? How did that affect these theorists and these historians approaching the nuclear weapons? Um, I think that that largely comes out well, late 60s, early 70s. And, uh, and, and I think that it starts to influence them thinking about the anti-nuclear movement, especially in Europe, right? As we're talking about, you know, basing and building tactical nuclear weapons bases there and stationing weapons there, that there there's a, a much more social environmental movement that talks about, you know, we're on the front edge of this. And if this nuclear war thing kicks off in the in Europe, uh, lots of Europeans are going to die. And I think that starts to influence kind of later generations of, of theorists. Uh, I think Brody's there in the beginning, but yet the environment hasn't matured to the point where uh, you have kind of the growing anti-nuclear movement. You know, Carl Sagan is a you know, nuclear winner and the environmental aspects. So I think that's a function of the later Cold War probably the last two decades. Um, theorists pay a little bit of attention to it, but not much because part of their job is they have to produce ideas that can be translated from theory into doctrine mm-hmm. or doctrine into war plans. Mm-hmm. And if you start factoring, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that are going to die and this is going to ruin the environment, that, that tends to color your war plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, you get a rift in the school where, and this is like Peter Pry and those characters that, that will talk about, you know, you have to think about that, but the reality is the hard part of the job is now building war plans and isolating yourself from the reality of what nuclear, we- what nuclear war weapons are going to do. So that's where that, that kind of strategic studies background I talked about, you just don't talk about people. Yeah, it kind of removes a COA if you're saying you can't kill a whole bunch of people when the weapon is to kill a whole bunch of people. Right, and I mean, and again, the calculus involved, it's just in many ways, you're trying to extract the Clausewitzian human side of this and it becomes very formulaic that, okay, I need to kill X number of ICBM fields, so I need X number of weapons, and here's the probability of kill. So you just work through the math, and the math gives you the number. Do you worry about the environmental effect? Well, no, because I'm just fixated on, I need to you know, make sure they don't have a counterforce capability to strike me again. So it has an impact, I think, more on the, the democratic side of theorists who start thinking about, no, 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 wait a minute. You know, why do we need 70,000 warheads? Maybe 5,000 is enough because the implication becomes what happens to all that radiation. So I think it starts to affect the way we think about it, especially at the end of the Cold War and arms control agreements. But in the first generation, it's so new, and we're still learning about the effects of nuclear weapons. We don't know about fallout yet. No, I mean, they found out about fallout at the first test, right? Mm -hmm. They they have all these awesome Navy ships they captured, and they do the first test with the idea that they're going to tow these halls back in, 
inspect them and they realize, oh, they're full of radiation, right. that we can't do it. And they're so full of radiation that, yeah, it's deadly. Um, and that becomes, there's a book they publish, the government publishes every few years called The Effects of Nuclear Weapons. Um, and what they do is they always update it after tests. And it, it's a phenomenal study on, um, num- number one, the quantum physics involved, and number two, the effects of the tests and how the evolution of their underst- the U.S. government's understanding, the military's understanding of what is the reality of these weapons. So you, you've raised this idea of kind of a tension between theory and reality, and, and we see that play out in the early period that we've been talking about, right? So you mentioned in the C-68, um, we, we also mentioned George Kennan, his famous article in 1947, and of course the elephant in the early years of the Cold War is the Korean War, which okay. is a, a large-scale war being fought by conventional armies with nuclear weapons available. Right. So how do these events shape the theory of the time and that follows? No, that's a great question. Um, if you look at MacArthur's decision, right, MacArthur wants to use some nuclear weapons to keep the Chinese out of the war and create this essentially curtain of radiation right, right on the yellow, right. Which, Very effective, again. <laughs> well, right, we, we, have, we have, a, have a debate with my students every year about this because we have an awesome lesson on Korea that militarily speaking, MacArthur is making the exact right decision. And I think this case study, more than anything, demonstrates the rift between, really, the practitioners and the theorists. And in many ways, are represented by MacArthur and Truman. Uh, that MacArthur, you know, militarily speaking, if your objective is to fight and win, nuclear weapons are the way to go, right? Radiation curtain, you cut lots of Chinese, you deter them from coming in. Perfect, right? Makes all sense if you're looking at it through a soda straw. If you're Truman, you can't necessarily allow this to happen because, number one, the Soviets have tested their first atomic bomb in 49. You have no intelligence on how many they have or their capacity or capability. So this is where the evolution of that escalatory ladder, I think, comes into play. That if you're Truman, you can't allow MacArthur to do that because you simply don't know what the Soviets have and are you willing to risk you know, global nuclear war? And if the answer is no, you keep war at a much lower level. And, you know, you tell MacArthur, no, you can't do it, which we all know how that lesson turned out, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, and MacArthur, of course, gets himself uh, thanks for his service for that. Well, right, but, but I don't think Truman gets enough credit for understanding the fundamental shift that's happened at the strategic level that if you simply don't know what your enemy has, it's going to influence the decisions you make and your capacity to prosecute a war. And this is the whole evolution of limited war, right? The, the idea that you're going to have to have limited objectives and, and assess what are you willing to risk? Uh, what are the costs? How much can the nation bear? And what are the second and third order effects internationally and strategically? And I think Truman does a very good job of, of balancing those versus just let's fight the war the kind of way we would have in 44, 45. Which is pretty remarkable for a man who never went to college and served only at a low level in the military. Right. Well, yeah, and I'm putting a lot of onus on, on Truman, but ultimately it's, it's his decision, but he's also being influenced by folks in DOD and uh, NHTSA, uh, Kennan, and then ultimately Marshall. And I think Marshall's a, a profound influence on, on Truman. So we've mentioned the escalation ladder several times. Can you explain that more? <laughs> yeah, and if you could walk us through. So we have we have this first generation, right? Yeah. So we're now transitioning to the second generation in the 50s. So so who are the thinkers of the second generation, and, and where does this escalation ladder come yeah, from? Yeah, the, the second generation thinkers, uh, I, I think, become Henry, Henry Kissinger, uh, Herman Kahn, um, Herman Woke, some of those, George Smoke is, is in that. Do they all rhyme? Yeah. Woke, smoke? Yeah, it's the 50s, right? It's, it's a jazz age, right? So it's, it's hip and cool. Um, and, and they all come from academia. Um, and the, the escalatory ladder, it, it, I, I would argue, is always there, right? If you understand kind of warfare and the way nations, how they prosecute and kind of get into war. But it comes much more, uh, much more defined by Herman Kahn in, in his classic tome on escalation. Cause Khan writes two books, right, because he wants to be the classics of the nuclear era. So his first one's on thermonuclear war, right, which is, I recommend folks try to read it, but it is as dense as Clausewitz, if not more so. Um, <laughs> on escalations, I think a better work, because it talks about how do you build these steps from kind of 
low diplomatic tension all the way up to the global thermonuclear war. And that's where the, the latter kind of comes into play. You have Robert Osgood and a bunch of other theorists, again, coming from the a- academic side who are trying to understand how nuclear weapons have changed the way nations behave in relation to one another. And this idea that it's not just about, okay, we're going to fight, you know, you've insulted my um, honor, so now now we have to fight. Nuclear weapons change it and make it more slow and deliberate. And I think what it does is it, it tries, nations want to push warfare down to kind of a lowest common denominator now. Uh, so there becomes, it starts out at kind of, if you think about a ladder, a ladder with maybe two or three rungs on it. And then Collins going to say, no, 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 it has 44 rungs. So it becomes an eminently more complex dynamic where you have limited war, you kind of have conventional war, and in, in limited war you kind of have, you know, insurgencies, guerrilla operations. And then there's kind of a gray area that starts transitioning into kind of conventional war. And then beyond conventional war, you kind of have this line that will become called a fire break. And if you broach that, it becomes thermonuclear war, and then you're going to end up with limited nuclear war, and then also, you know, global thermonuclear war. So you end up with this idea of whatever your political objective is, trying to figure out what is the right level on the ladder, what is the right rung to be at, but you always have to be prepared to go two or three rungs higher um, and then respond if your enemy wants to go four rungs higher. Limited nuclear war seems like an oxymoron, like the tactical nuclear weapon. What does that mean? It, It means that both sides kind of tangentially agree that you'll keep nuclear war in this kind of nice tight box. It, it, that's really a product of the late seven, well, mid mid to late seventies, uh, and the idea that if you have to fight in and win against the Soviet Union in Europe, that you can unleash such devastation that after a few rounds of nuclear exchanges at the tactical level, everybody will agree they should stop. And you bring up something um, that you've kind of talked around a, a couple of times, which is technology is also changing during this time, right? True. So for the first generation, a nuclear weapon was dropped out of a plane, usually pretty dangerously. I think the, no, the Hiroshima drop, easy. the plane was traveling like 75 miles an hour or something because of a headwind. But then by the end of the 50s, we've got nuclear-tipped missiles. Eventually, we're going to have ICBMs, sea-launched missiles. So how does the technology change play into these theories? No, no, great question, because the first major technological shift is you move from atomic weapons to kind of hydrogen-based weapons, which is the nuclear side. Um, With with hydrogen-based weapons, you can make them smaller. They're cleaner in the fact that they don't produce as much kind of, you know, uh, fallout because there's not as much. A lot of the radiation is consumed in the blast and the heat. So the reaction you get from a thermonuclear weapon is more significant, but they're also smaller and easier to weaponize. At the same time, uh, we're working on uh, rocket technology, uh, liquid-fueled and then solid fuel. Uh, And once you get that, you can now develop both intercontinental ballistic missiles, intermediate-range ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and then you can build them in in bombers that can actually, you know, maintain a a good speed of 3,300, 400 miles an hour in jet aircraft, so they don't have to be kind of lumbering and slow targets. So not those giant, like the big boy or no. whatever. No, I mean, they, the small. Well, yeah, they end up with big ones. I mean, you know, I think we in the 50s and 60s, you end up with everything from kind of about 10 to 15 kiloton up to several megaton. But they're not as unwieldy as the first, you know, first generation. They become, well, there's a whole industry that evolved to produce them because, again, that ladder of escalation, I think one of the good definitions of deterrence is capability times credibility. You have to make sure you have the capability. So technology is used to, to produce a whole range of tactical all the way up through strategic weapons. And they have to be usable because if they're not, your enemy may be able to exploit a seam of deterrence. So you've, you've uh, given us a good rundown of, of Herman Kahn's kind of the, the broad construct of his thought. Um, what about Kissinger? What, where does Kissinger come at this? Kissinger comes in, I mean, he writes you know, his dissertation kind of on, on, on these topics, right? And, and is brought into really the Eisenhower administration as an advisor. And at first, he seems to be a little more in the Brody camp, right, with, uh, yeah, these things are a bit different, but the reality is, you know, as, as you see the world evolving with Indochina and what seems to be the kind of the second generation of Soviet expansionism, that maybe they need to be checked and the Soviet Union is expanding their military capabilities and specifically their nuclear capabilities. So he starts out, I think, much more on kind of maybe the centrist in the debate and then ends up much more on the right side of the debate that you have to be strong and vigilant with these things. Okay, what about Herman Wolk? 
Herman Woke is fully on the Brody side. In fact, I think Brody um, Woke is kind of the second generation of Brody, and I think tries to make it a, a little more palatable that, okay, we should probably be much more in line with um, thinking about weapons of last resort versus uh, getting all um, fixated on uh, massive retaliation, which is the hallmark of the Eisenhower administration, which is, the Eisenhower administration is fascinating. So you, you have this idea that of mass retaliation, which is really uh, a Dulles Brothers idea, that they don't believe that the Truman administration was calling the shots. They were being dictated to by the Soviet Union, and they thought that was a kind of a loser position to be in. So they're, it, really, it's about containment, and, and they make the argument that if you threaten high you know, nuclear weapon use, that it makes, it makes the enemy, i.e. the Soviet Union, think. So it really is about shifting from symmetrical containment to asymmetrical containment. And, and I would argue it works for about three years because the United States has a technological, technological offset in strategic weapons. Uh, but once the Soviets get an ICBM, they can threaten the same thing back. So it, it's just unique shift, and I think woke becomes what's going to evolve into the Mutual Shared Destruction School with uh, McNamara and Richard Smoke and those characters. So you can kind of see the evolution. So you just you just mentioned another um, person in Smoke. So is is there anything more to his theory? No, I think once you get Brody and once you get Khan, the generations just become a reiteration and a refinement of the original theory, mm -hmm. and those are contextualized within uh, the debate on policy and war plans as you move through Eisenhower and into Kennedy and Johnson. Do the Soviets also have kind of this complicated theoretical discussion happening on their side? Yes and no. Uh, if you read Sokolovsky, you know, Soviet military thinking, uh, the complexity is a different complexity. It's not whether we should use these or not, at least on the military side. And, you know, I, I haven't been into the archives to see if there was a, a lively debate. I'd venture to guess maybe, but it was never recorded. Uh, but Sokolovsky, it, it, it's complex because they weave in Marxist ideology and theory, mm -hmm. and it's always defensive, yet it's inherently offensive, which is kind of weird. Um, but, but the debate on whether nuclear weapons are something inherently different and should be reserved for you know a force of last resort, or are they something that should be used from you know the very inception of, of the decision to go to war, is never debated. From what I've seen, the Soviets seem to always assume a weapon is a weapon is a mm -hmm. weapon. Why would you hold it back? And um, there's a kind of more simple logic to that. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know, the Soviets don't have a the way they understand war is conditioned by losing millions upon millions of their own people. Uh, we haven't had that experience as, as American citizens. So I think that tempers the way they think about it. That Okay, if you have to fight when people are going to die anyway, so what's another three million or four million? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's what you're, you're explaining um, from the American side. You know, we're always maybe on the reactionary, maybe what we need to have the Soviets reacting to us. But if the Soviets just considered another weapon, maybe that's a dangerous game to play because they're going to always try to match the United States or surpass or us. It. Yeah, yeah. And I would argue that's one of the problems with, so if we talk about a sure destruction and mutual sure destruction, right? A sure destruction is an idea that um, that McNamara brings online uh, in, in like 61, 62 uh, about mutual, uh, mass retaliation was dangerous. Uh, definitely by 57, 58, it's a hopelessly outdated concept that is uh, that threatens the stability of, of the nuclear environment. And Maxwell Taylor talks about this as Army Chief of Staff. Uh, Ridgway talked about it as Chief of Staff, and they're both politely asked to resign, right? Or maybe retire is a better word, right? Thank you for your service. Uh, yeah, thank you for your service and, and you know, interest in national defense, but we we have somebody else in mind. Uh, and, and Taylor writes his, his, his famous book, right, The Uncertain Trumpet, and starts talking about these ideas about the escalatory ladder, which... The Eisenhower administration does a very good job of building up the tactical nuclear side of the ladder and the strategic side of the ladder. In fact, the Eisenhower administration is is the place where we see the evolution of the triad, uh, the strategic nuclear triad, and, which is which is ICBMs, right? So intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine launched ballistic missiles, and what becomes strategic air command. And strategic air command owns two of those legs. Additionally, you have a joint kind of 
you know, facility up in Omaha that, that initiates the single integrated operational plan or SIOP. And there's a joint targeting board. So everything under Eisenhower becomes streamlined into kind of one strategic environment. Whereas previously, um, individual regional commanders had some release authority, which was dangerous, and Eisenhower <laughs> wasn't a big fan of that. Again, the human dimension. <laughs> yeah, no, no, right. And Eisenhower was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You mean Curtis LeMay could do this on his own? Well, sir, sort of, but not really. So so you streamline it to make it more uh, effective and efficient at the, at the tactical and strategic level. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> We're walking through massive retaliation. Massive retaliation, right, retaliation yeah. versus so that's, mutually assured yeah, destruction. So massive retaliation builds that that you're going to fight and, and win, and you know no matter what incursion happens, you know if, if the Soviets want to push in Indochina, the the Eisenhower administration is right to you know launch ICBMs at Moscow. Great until the Soviets have ICBMs. So the idea of assured destruction is a shift away from that, where you're not going to target cities. It's going to become a counter force uh, target set, so you're not holding Soviet or Chinese cities at risk, which is supposed to de escalate the tension. Uh, the problem with assured destruction that McNamara is going to um, run into, and I think theoretically it makes sense to move away from city busting, uh, which is a, a major component of massive retaliation. The problem is you have to build a new class of strategic weapons that are more accurate and more precise and and the warheads are more sophisticated. The problem though is that as you start to build those weapons to kind of de-escalate, those weapons inherently seem to be more offensive minded and have the capacity for a first strike. So from the Soviet perspective, the language that the U.S. is talking about, assured destruction, is, is designed to de-escalate, but the actions they're taking to, to initiate it produce a series of weapons that seem to be capable of initiating a first strike, which sets the Soviets all on ease. And they're already coming from a place of suspicion if they're rooted and in this Marxist theory. Exactly, right. They're always suspicious of the capitalists. And McNamara, to his credit, recognizes that, which is good. And this is okay, we're going to make this. So he, the assured destruction comes out of his No City speech, which he does in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and then he, the next iteration becomes Mutual Assured Destruction, which is okay. Assured destruction allows one side to build up and move away from cities, but the reality is that makes the other side feel a bit insecure. So let's go back to security and stabilize everything, which is the mutual part of this. So the idea is, okay, maybe we'll leave cities on, on, on the target set and the weapon systems won't be as precise to initiate a first strike. And we're going to also assume that you think about nuclear weapons the same way we do. Nobody wants to use them. We have enough to kind of, you know, check each other. So therefore, let's just de-escalate that way, which is, in theory, a perfect place to be. And then with McNamara, McNamara says that at that point, we can initiate real arms control and kind of negotiate a away from the, the cliff. The problem is the Soviets don't think that way, mm -hmm. right? So the, so the Soviets will embrace mutual assured destruction politically and diplomatically. Oh, yes, we don't want to do that. But the reality is, if you start thinking about their war plans and reading about their war plans, they're going to be prepared to fight and win. So it's not a weapon of last resort, which is the hallmark of mutual assured destruction. That they really become political bargaining chips. The Soviets, yes, absolutely, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, until we have to fight a war, and then we're going to use these things from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, theory versus practice, right? That I think you need to understand the Soviet psychology. And a lot of times... McNamara had a way of, of transposing his ideas on the, on the enemy. That no, no, they must think like me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the famous uh, story is, you know, when he wants to think about, you know, Ho Chi Minh, he'd interview himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he did the same thing with the Soviets, right? So the problem is the Soviets don't think like we do because they're Russians and right. Ukrainians and, you know. Right. Yeah, you bring up a fascinating point, which is many, if not pretty much all of the people we've talked about, uh, possible exception of Maxwell Taylor, have been academics. And academics have a, t have a kind of transnational community. So do these <coughs> deterrents and nuclear theorists, do they have that same kind of connection? Or, or do they go to conferences with their Soviet counterparts? Or are these completely separated? No, they're completely separated. Because uh, it's so compartmentalized, right? So, so um, a lot of these folks work, will come in and out of government service and you keep those discussions within the Pentagon and the think tanks and the national labs. Occasionally, uh, debates will spill out, books will be written, mm 
passive voice, you know, <laughs> right. purposely used. Right. But there's there's no attempt, I, I would argue, until you kind of start to get the arms control, like the strategic arms limitation talks, the first one, where you start talking about these ideas, and that's going to kind of break the ice. But there aren't, to my knowledge, there aren't, you know, secret international conferences where the theorists from both blocks get together and discuss, mm -hmm. you know, let's add another ladder on the escalatory ladder because everyone's so suspicious of everyone else. Yeah, it does make sense. So we were talking about we did first phase, third phase, or second phase. Is there a third phase? And where does McNamara kind of sit within these various generations? No, that, that's a good, I think the McNamara is, so if first phase is Truman and the evolution of, well, it, it's a continuation combined bomber offensive, but with atomic weapons, if that's phase one, Phase two is mutual assured destruction, no, I'm sorry, is massive retaliation under Eisenhower and, and the building of the tactical and strategic side of, of the latter. Uh, McNamara and, and Maxwell Taylor are in the third phase where they build the conventional side of it, so limited war, which I think the war is going to stay mostly there for the duration of the Cold War. Um, so McNamara fits into that. So he, he's trying to build a more full ladder, so not just on the strategic nuclear side, but also on the conventional side to make sure you have, you know, in, in parlance today, full spectrum operations. So we're moving now into uh, what is probably the, the single most disruptive decade in American history, barring the 1860s, uh, which is the 1960s, right? Uh, so lots of things are happening in that decade. Uh, decolonization and the wars that go with it. Uh, economic problems in both blocks, and of course, American society is essentially falling apart, kind of culminating in 1968. Uh, and one, and two of those threads meet in Vietnam. So, yeah, or in Prague too, by the way. Yeah, right. So I mean, I would argue the Soviets are are under sub 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 significant tension economically and socially from Budapest in '56, and then uh, the Czechoslovakians in '68, who are pushing back against, you know, they want a softer and more, you know, human <laughs> communist regime. Right. So so how does, how then does theory and deterrence um, projects, how do those shape themselves to the, the big changes taking place in this decade? I think you start to say, and this is where you, you move away from kind of Brezhnev, or I'm sorry, Khrushchev into Brezhnev, and, and Brezhnev, and to some degree Khrushchev too, coming out of the Second World War, the, both of those Soviet leaders understand the horrific devastation that wars uh, have impacted on the Soviet Union uh, and, and don't necessarily want to charge headlong into another one. Um, the social political tension that Dr. Rieto talked about earlier is, is coming to bear on both sides. Uh, the Soviet tension is more internal from this, uh, what, what is the Warsaw Pact, um, and they're getting more scrutiny. Uh, there is also the beginnings of recognition that the economic system of the Soviets uh, is beginning to crack and break, but yet they can't fix it systemically. You can put Band-Aids on it, and we'll see how that plays out all the way through 89 and 91. Spoilers, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, right, exactly. Sometimes a second chest wound right. is just that, right? Um, so I think what you see in this is, you know, Johnson's going to kind of start the, the, the initiation of a real strategic weapons talks. I mean, there's deals about um, comprehensive test bans under Kennedy and some other ideas, but both sides are feeling, I think, the pressure from below. And part of that is this social political idea that, okay, maybe we need to back away from the abyss and kind of, you know, everybody, you know, the Pulp Fiction moment, right? Be cool, honey bunny. Yeah. Right? Everyone just need to chill out a little bit and let's just talk this thing through. We don't and, all want to die. No, right. And, and to Nixon's credit, you know, he's going to go negotiate the first major strategic arms limitation talk. And I think it's, it's a good step in the right direction that, okay, we have these things, everything else is happening in the world. What you don't want is some of those backfire wars or brush wars that grow up into something more significant, which, which you know, happens in Cuba, which happens in Suez. Mm -hmm. um, it happens to an extent in Vietnam. True. And we also have, uh, during the same period, uh, Russia and China shoot at each other a few times. They do. They do. So I think, I'm fascinated by 68. I think 68 is one of those years where, you know, as Americans, we, oh, 68, you know, the Tet Offensive and everything else going on at home, this, you know, the Democratic National Convention. But if you look at it globally, 68 is just one of those basket case years, kind of like 1848 in European history, mm -hmm. right? That the, the Soviets going to suppress a significant uprising in Prague, uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, and that I think fundamentally changes the way that people of the Warsaw Pact view the Soviet Union, that it's never going to be quite the same ever again. Uh, you get Freedom 77, that's going to emerge from that. I would argue Helsinki Accords in 73 emerge from that. And it puts s substantial pressure on the Soviet Union from the human rights side. And this is kind of the fourth generation, which is kind of Carter, who doesn't do a whole lot to shift the nature of the kind of the, of the arc of strategic uh, theory, but what he starts to use is kind of human rights as a lever to put more significant pressure on the Soviets because they're most vulnerable there. So uh, I think 68 is the beginning of probably maybe the fourth generation, okay. and you're going to get better technology, and it, there's always a refinement within nuclear strategy, and this is where Lawrence Friedman, I think his book is right on the money, it's all about the evolution of it, right? So there's always a continual call from presidents, from Truman up through Reagan, maybe even Bush, about I, I want more flexibility and I want more options. Mm -hmm. And um, those are going to come out with, with uh, Carter, Reagan, uh, but the reality is the arc's already there. Mutual sure destruction has become kind of the, the penultimate uh, foundation, mm -hmm. and now it's just how do you get, you know, now half steps on an escalatory ladder versus just full steps. And, and um, you, you, you bring up a couple of, of very interesting points. One of those is that the, the previous generation scholars didn't go away. I, I had an English no. professor who would love to talk about how we, we like to talk about shifts in tone and you know we move from modernism to realism or whatever. But the old people don't go away. So it doesn't turn off a switch, right? Of course, Kissinger is a major influence well through yeah. the 70s right. and then as an academic to the present. So how do the previous generation's thinkers adapt to these new ideas? No, that, that's a great, uh, let's, let's use Paul Nitze as a great example, right? Who, who, who comes, lives an absurdly long. Uh, right, and, 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 is, and is, as does Kennan too, by yeah. the way, right? They both die, I think, around 2005. Uh, correct, right. And I think Kennan dies a little after that. Yeah. They outlive the Soviet Union. So. Yes. They do, they do. But Nitz is fascinating the fact that he will come back under, let's see, the Carter administration and then the Bush or Reagan administration and the Committee on Present Danger, which is a debate happening coming out of the Nixon administration and in, into, you know, Ford, Carter, Reagan about the CIA's analysis of the Soviet Union that they may be soft selling it, that the Soviet Union may be um, more vulnerable, right? And there are elements coming out of the Nixon presidency that are arguing, no, 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 you guys are making them too soft. You always have to respect, you know, the 12 foot tall Soviets that they're just trying to dupe you. So the Committee on President Danger, NHTSA becomes, I think, the president of that, and there's a whole bunch of academics and practitioners who become part of it. And what's unique is they're, George, George H.W. Bush is the director of the CIA at this time, and he gives them the same data and intelligence that the CIA gets in their analysts, and they produce kind of a, a parallel report, and their report is, no, 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 the Soviet Union's coming back stronger than ever. Which, if you look at it on the strategic weapons side, they are. They're developing a brand new series of, of generation of bombers, submarine launch ballistic missiles, and heavy ICBMs with multiple uh, targetable warheads. So if you look at it without the without the, the people and the emotional aspect, the economic side, the calculus we talked about earlier, the Soviets look like they are roaring back from the 60s. And this is the Andropov years? Yeah. And he is, uh, if I remember correctly. Ah, it's correct. prior to Andropov. It's, it's Brezhnev. It's still Brezhnev. <laughs> yeah. And Andropov is going to, 83, uh, which is going to be SDI and all that fun stuff. But, but Andropov... And drop off in many ways is a resurgent to the past. And drop off is obsessed that Reagan's going to start uh, a nuclear war, and is obsessed with Reagan's uh, rhetoric that he's really going to start. He's going to initiate a first strike. So, and drop off significance on the Soviet side is that he doubles down on the paranoia. In fact, he's he's the premier or you know uh, general secretary who's going to unite both the KGB and the GRU which is GRU is the military intelligence wing. KGB is kind of their version of the CIA, but with you know more, a more heinous past. Um, they're gonna work together for the first time on a drop off and they're gonna initiate ideas and, and operations throughout the world to ensure that they don't get caught off guard. So it's things like they start counting the number of cars in the Pentagon parking lot after 5 p.m. <laughs> they start talking about how many pizzas are being delivered to 
know, various nuclear, you know, sac bases, you know, after 5 p.m. Yeah, I think obsession was probably the right yeah, word to use. Yeah, obsession. <laughs> and what, what's comical, I've done some research on, on the Soviet side, the intelligence apparatus thinks Andropov's a crackpot. <laughs> and, and he leverages, I wonder why. Yeah, he, he, and he leverages all these assets, and they're like, yeah, it's not going to happen. I mean, because by 83, Reagan's starting to soften a little bit, like the rhetoric that he used to get elected and maintains is starting to kind of be tempered by SDI and some other ideas. And then drop off is just completely out of touch. And in many ways is that last old Soviet leader, maybe Chernyanko, but Chernyanko doesn't live long enough to impact anything, right? And, and he doesn't have that obsessive KGB background like Andropov had. So Andropov is, is a unique moment that you can see the withering of the kind of the old Soviet past because the whole organization and structure and his obsession with nuclear war and who has to be first is is quickly being dismissed as, no, no, I think we're in a different place now. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that's happening during this period, kind of the, the, the few decades we're talking about, is the, the proliferation of nuclear capabilities, right? So it's kind of a given that the British will have nuclear weapons from the beginning. The French gain them. Um, the French build their own. There's a right. great story where the Algerian rebels almost capture a French nuclear weapon. That would have been the desert, yeah. right? Exactly. Like put it on the back of a truck, like. I maybe maybe a, a draft animal, <laughs> um, but I, perhaps more saliently, the Chinese gain nuclear mm -hmm. capabilities. The Israelis gain nuclear capabilities. And not admittedly. Not um, admittedly. Right. Pakistan, um, Pakistan, India. Pakistan and India, right? So how South does the, Africa. How does that change? The, the, the story where we no longer have a bipolar discussion. Yeah, I would argue that, and this is one of the dynamics of the Cold War that I think a lot of people gloss over. I, I would argue the Cold War is, n it seems to be bipolar, but it's never bipolar. It, it's always multipolar. You always have the Yugoslavias, you have the Egypts, you have the, you know, the Indians. That It's a much more dynamic Cold War. Nuclear weapons change that a bit, and the reality is there's a discussion in the Cold War that we need to limit proliferation, and only those responsible countries are allowed to have them, right? Because don't worry, we'll, we'll provide an umbrella over everybody else. Very colonialist thinking. Very colonialist thinking. But as you move through the 60s and 70s, not bad thinking because you don't want the Algerians, the ALN, FLN to have them. You don't want, you know, uh, other nefarious groups to have them. Or the apartheid government of South Africa. Well, right. And, and, no, and, and South Africa is the only nation that has only given up weapons because simply um, the white supremacist government didn't want the, uh, you know... The, they didn't want that heat. No, well, <laughs> they feared it, right? And the idea that... And it, it's a good case in the fact that Oh well, yeah, let's just get rid of them. So prolifer proliferation starts to kind of, kind of, kind of ebb and flow. Where the first generation is, let's limit proliferation. That you know those responsible countries, because it gives you a special responsibility and kind of an ethical, moral charge to kind of think about these things, uh, which I've always bought into. Right? That yeah, they are something different and unique, and it requires a different way of thinking, possibly, or at least a broader way of thinking. Coming into the late 80s and 90s, there's a discussion about, and this, this is coming from kind of a conservative bent in, in the Pentagon, that maybe proliferation, this is as the Cold War is ending, maybe proliferation is a good thing. So you go from kind of let's maintain the number of nations that have them, to maybe proliferation is good because the more nations that have them, you normalize it, and then, then you hold them to a higher responsible standard. That has never made any sense to me. Because it assumes rational actor theory that, you know, the way I think is the same way you both think. And We're we'll, back to McNamara. We, yeah, yep. we, will, we will all agree that these things are heinous and dangerous and we should never use them. Right. Until I don't like something you did and all of a sudden I'm going to pop off a nuclear weapon. Again, you offended my honor. and Right. And, and I think we're still at that stage of, okay, is proliferate should, should only a set number of countries have these or should everybody be allowed to get them? And, yeah. Well, and also the, the complicating that factor that you see, especially after 1980, is uh, the rise of non-state actors, right? Correct. Whether it's a Correct. radical religious group, whether it's now a, a multinational company. Um, we tend to forget in history, companies used to be as powerful or more powerful sure. than states, right? Yeah, United Fruit Company. company. Right. right. So how, yeah. does, how does deterrence theory take into account the non-state actor, maybe the jihadi group? I don't know the, if it, it, it does, because for the duration of the Cold War... Those groups, which have shifted really since 79, right, in the Iranian Revolution, were always held in kind of that lower end of, of the ladder where, you know, it's unconventional war, 
they're gorillas. They can be kind of suppressed and stopped, and really it's dealt with kind of on an ad hoc basis. Uh, if you look at from the Iranian Revolution on in seventy nine, again eighty three becomes another one of kind of sixty eight moments. So in eighty three, the Reagan administration is starting to really kind of look at the, the growth of what becomes uh, kind of transnational terrorism. At the same time, the Soviet Union is fighting their war in Afghanistan, recognizes almost the exact same kind of emergence of this threat. The problem is they're both so locked in the Cold War tension, they don't recognize there's a mutual threat out there that is evolving in kind of this fourth dimension that no one wants to pay attention to. So until the Cold War goes away, the whole evolution of what will become transnational terrorism and Al-Qaeda is kind of left to kind of fester with Hamas, Hezbollah, mm-hmm. and, and we end up in the kind of that awesome 1990s quagmire. It's the best kind of quagmire. So we are now well beyond the end of the Cold War, although I think some people don't realize that. Uh, We now live in a world that is no longer ideologically as fraught or as kind of monolithically bipolar, although there are problems with that construct. So what's the utility then, beyond historical understanding, of, of working through these generations of theory? I think it's understanding how that theory uh, can be adapted and applied to today. Uh, I read an article, which was an epiphany about about a month ago, about how traditional deterrence here in the U.S. has really been focused on bipolarity between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. But now it's a multipolar, multidynamic deterrence idea that it's really, and the article is structured where it focuses on the United States, Russia, and China. And all of a sudden, how does the dynamic change if all of a sudden you have a third party who can kind of play both sides against one another or exploit, you know, while I'm focusing on Dr. Abel, all of a sudden Rio's like, well, okay, these two fight, I can swoop in and pick up the pieces. Mm -hmm. And it it, it was an eye-opener in the fact that we always think of deterrence theory as kind of, you know, binary, you know, zeros and ones, but all of a sudden what happens when you enter a two or three or a four? And now it changes the whole way you think about Mm-hmm. the construct. So I think we have to take what we can from the Cold War and adapt it and shift it to a, a much more dynamic and multipolar discussion today. And, and I know some folks are working on how do you apply the theory to cyber, you know, cyber warfare, how do you apply mm-hmm. it to space warfare. So I think it's useful, but we also have to be, we have to be careful of the context that, you know, you just can't pull the term theory and plug it in. That the whole security environment has shifted substantially in the way we think about warfare it's mm-hmm. shift, shifted substantially. Yeah, we need to be careful of the people who slip and say Soviet Union still. Hmm. Yeah, I, I may be guilty of doing that myself sometimes. <laughs> but uh, Right. But I think it, it's useful in the fact that as long as you understand that the theories have to be uh, twisted and contorted to fit and, and maybe evolved mm-hmm. and uh, extended, I think it's useful. I think the problem becomes when, you know, I have this solution. We need to build more nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe, right? Maybe not. All right, Germany right. is under the jet. You get a yeah, nuclear weapon. Exactly, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, everyone yeah. gets nuclear weapons. Yeah, they open right. room for you. Yeah, yeah, and you yes. get one, and you get one, and mm-hmm. everyone will be cool, right? Maybe not the answer. Right, right. All right, Dr. Kalik, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you. No, uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you like this episode, please make sure to check out our other podcast, Broad Gauge Gossips, where we talk to members of the Department of Military History faculty so you can get to know them.